Hello, everybody. This is Lewis Mart, uh, Director of Client Services and Marketing at YWCA Hanover. And we are uh, happy to um, welcome you to another Facebook Live Enlightened Conversations. And I'm going to turn it over to our intrepid host, Lisa Smith. Hi, thanks, Lou. Enlightened Conversations uh, took a little bit of a break over the holiday season and into January, and we're very happy to be back again. Uh, if you recall, our, our purpose in this is to bring together people from throughout the community to discuss issues of social injustice, discrimination, and racism. And through these various conversations, we hope that we can learn more about each other as well as more about what we can do together to end the injustices that we see between various groups of people. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome Rachel Singer from the Jewish Community Center. Um, Rachel will explain to you a little bit about her job at JCC, and then she's gonna give us an overview of Judaism. Um, a lot of us may be unfamiliar with the actual facts about the Jewish faith, unless you happen to be raised in that. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there about various faiths. So we're hoping that through these kinds of conversations, we can get to the actual facts about what various groups believe, and why some of them have been persecuted for so long. So Rachel, I'm gonna turn it over to you. First of all, can you tell us your title at JCC and how long you've been in that position? Sure, thank you all for inviting me to come and speak. Um, this is one of the many uh, perks of my job that I really love, although um, normally it's speaking to um, children either in schools or um, were in person. Um, so this is really nice being able to come to you in this format during this um, hectic time we're living in. Um, I am the culture and arts director at the York JCC. I've been there now for seven years. I have my master's degree in Jewish studies with a concentration in Jewish philosophy and mysticism. Um, and this has really been such a privilege to come here to York and move here and start a family. Um, and um, I get to do a lot of fun and wonderful educational outreach programs at the J, as well as a lot of entertainment having to do with the arts and culture. That's great. That's great. Sounds like a varied position. A yes, bit of everything. Yeah. <laughs> it is yeah. many hats, as I'm sure um, everyone at the Y um, at the YCA um, knows as well. Yes, yeah, I think that's the nature of nonprofit organizations. So, I agree. One thing that I'm hoping you can explain for me this evening, and um, I'll, I'll pose this question, then I'll let you. Um, explain. I know you've got a presentation put together, but one thing that I've always been uncertain of is Judaism a faith that developed into a culture, or is Judaism a culture that has religious components? It's kind of like the chicken and the egg for me. I can't quite figure out what came first, so I'll turn that over to you. So I have to say that um, I absolutely love this question. I love that you are thinking of it in that duality of terms. Um, however, I don't feel, and much like the, you know, did the chicken or the egg come first, much like that philosophical philosophical concept, I'm not sure that it has a true and concrete 
answer. Um, okay. Judaism kind of sprouted up as a peoplehood, as a nationhood. Um, it developed, um, you know, religious ideologies, but it is all melded together. Um, and um, it also varies a lot from person to person. Um, you know, there's a lot of diversity, um, even within the small Jewish community. So you you might get lots of different opinions about that, whether or not it's a culture or a faith, or is it a culture first or a religious belief? Um, it's um, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as I'm sure most things are. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I know that you had some basic background that you wanted to take us through before we started firing questions at you. So I'm sure. gonna let you start with that and then um, we'll kind of fill in with questions if we need to. Excellent, I think that that sounds great. Um, so I was really honored to come and speak to you all about Judaism. Um, I wanted to go over some of the basic beliefs of Judaism, um, talk a little bit um, about some of our variety of holidays because there's so many of them, um, some more well known than others, yeah. and um, some of the importance of those holidays. And um, then we can also talk about um, the life cycle events um, and a big question that I come across um, while doing these presentations and engaging with um, the community. Um, there's normally a lot of questions around keeping kosher and Jewish dietary laws. So we'll just kind of um, play around with some of these topics and then okay. I would love to hear questions from everybody. Okay. Um, so Judaism is a monotheistic religion, um, the belief of one God. Um, we, be, um, we read from the Torah or um, Christianity refers to it as the Old Testament. In Judaism, we don't refer to it as the Old Testament because old would mean that there has to be something new and we don't adhere to the New, tes to the new right. Testament. So it is just the Torah or um, the five books of Moses um, when we are referring to um, the right. Torah. Um, the Torah is written in Hebrew by scribes and um, and we have supplement supplementary material that goes along with it, which is called the Talmud and the Midrash. And those are all commentary on the biblical stories and the interpretations from the rabbis and the scholars, um, a rabbi being a, our religious figurehead. Um, there's a beautiful concept in um, Judaism called tikkun olam. Um, I make mention of this really because what you all are talking about um, by inviting individuals from different faiths or religions or ethnicities um, to talk about social justice um, and freedom and integrity, um, the tikkun olam really embodies that for Judaism and it it translates to repair the world. Um, mm, it means lovely. that the world was left broken for us to be the creators of the good and for us to shape it and rebuild it. And that's why in Judaism, there is such an emphasis on um, social justice. There is such an emphasis on um, sadaka, which is Hebrew for philanthropy and um, financial contributions, as well as um, your the giving of your time, volunteerism. Um, and um, tikkun olam is really what makes um, the JCC and nonprofit organizations really special, even if they don't adhere to Jewish values, right? Because we're all trying to leave the world a little bit better than we received it. Right. Um, Good question here, Rachel. That's great. Yes. We have a question here. How old is Judaism? Is there a beginning? Um, so it begins with Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. 
um, in terms of the law and the scripture and everything. But I mean, Judaism is an Abrahamic faith. And so it really, um, it really dates back to biblical um, Israel. Um, and I, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know um, my biblical dates as well as I probably should, but it was a very, very, very long time ago. <laughs> at least that's what I tell my children. Well, well, <laughs> let me ask you this question in full, full disclosure. I, I am Jewish. Okay. Um, what is the year now in the Jewish calendar? Oh, that's a good question. Five, uh, seven. Um, five, seven, Oh my goodness. I might even have to Google that. <laughs> you know, I feel like the pandemic has really kind of brushed over um, some of this time <laughs> with Good us now. this 57 year. 5781. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure. It's hard. I'm, I'm looking at, um, I'm looking for a person's face and I'm seeing the, the, Oh, I'm um, sorry. Banner, the beautiful yeah. banner here. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll open up just for this part, but yes, 5781. So Judaism or or the dictates from from God to Abraham are at right. least 5781, 5081 years old. And I will go back to being silent. <laughs> <laughs> That's please okay, can, Lou. Please contribute please. anytime. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, um, Rachel, you mentioned about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments from God. Uh, I think that's something that's kind of universal in many religions. And I came across that um, in, the, in, in some of my research for tonight. And one thing that really struck me was the similarity between the Ten Commandments as they were listed in the Torah and the Ten Commandments as they are listed in a Christian Bible, they're practically the same. You know, yeah. and there people make a big fuss about the differences in the religions, and yet here the basic um, rules, ten rules, are practically the same in the two. There is um, there is a lot of similarities between Judaism and Christianity. Um, Judeo Christian, um, you know, back in biblical times, everything was interwoven, um, mm -hmm. and Christianity um, historically, Jesus was Jewish um, right. until, he, until he wasn't, um, and became a you know um, the son of God in the eyes of um, Christians and those who follow, followed him then and continue to follow him now. Um, and so you will find, like I said, um, Christianity's Old Testament is, um, is our Bible. Um, right. We just yeah. don't refer to it as, the, as, um, as such. And it does, it's not the precursor um, to the New Testament, right? Um, so there's a lot of continuation on with the New Testament mm -hmm. and Jesus's teachings um, that just don't follow um, Judaism. It doesn't mean that, um, that we can't learn from those. We just don't, um, Jesus is not, um, this is not the Messiah to um, Jews. Right, you focus on those first, Correct. That first group of, of yep. books. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about the holidays. People get yeah. a little confused, and and mm -hmm. I've often heard about Jewish Christmas, and, <laughs> and it's not Jewish Christmas. It's you know, so uh, can you help us get a little straightened out on what the various holidays are. Yeah, I would love to do that. Um, so when I am typically in schools um, with young children, I ask them, the first thing I ask them is, have you, have you ever heard of Judaism? And what holiday do you know? And everybody raises their hand and they says, um, there's one right around Christmas where you get presents. Um, some yeah. of them <laughs> know that that's Hanukkah and others don't. Right. Um, and Hanukkah is the most largely known holiday, um, primarily because of secular culture. Mm -hmm. um, 
And um, but however, Judaism has a lot of really beautiful and wonderful holidays that are much more religiously significant um, than Hanukkah is. Um, so if we are looking at a calendar year, um, we start in around the September, October um, time frame of our Jewish high holidays, our holiest days of the year, which is called Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And Rosh Hashanah is, is, is the Jewish New Year. Um, and Yom Kippur is our Day of Atonement. Um, our Day of Atonement um, means that um, we fast um, so we have a 20, um, 24, 25 hour fast that we participate where we abstain from eating, from not eating or drinking. Um, and we repent for our sins during that time period. Um, after Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we move into a holiday called Sukkot. Um, and Sukkot is a beautiful holiday. It's a fall festive holiday holiday. Um, in English, Sukkot translates to the festival of booths. There's lots and lots of symbolism that goes along with this. My favorite interpretation is that we celebrate Sukkot to remind us that we were once nomadic people traveling in the desert and that nothing in life is permanent. So the Ooh. living dwellings that we um, typically Eden, it's called a sukkah and it looks like a straw house. Um, mm -hmm. And we eat our meals and we are able to see the sky through the brushings. Um, but it's really to remind us that nothing in life is permanent. And I just find that to be such a beautiful interpretation of, of um, the experience. Mm -hmm. um, after Sukkot, we have um, a, we we move into Hanukkah, right? Um, right. Hanukkah, or um, the Jewish Christmas, for lack of a better <laughs> phrase, um, that um, really celebrates the miracle of the Maccabees. It's a small army victory um, where there was a miracle of our oil um, that lasted for eight days and eight nights. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have a lot of religious connotation, um, but there's lots of um, family tradition. So we exchange presents, we light our menorah, we play with a dreidel, which is a little bit, um, a little top um, with Hebrew letters on it. Um, and there's lots of family gatherings and good food to eat. A lot mm -hmm. of all the Jewish holidays, except for Yom Kippur, all have food. Um, <laughs> We can have a whole other conversation about that. Yeah. Um, but As any um, good holiday would. It's yeah, gotta have food, it, right? it really does. Um, and um, so then actually right now we are moving from um, Hanukkah. We um, just celebrated a, a small holiday called Tu Bichvat. Um, and that is the birthday of the trees where we celebrate the environment and the um, nuts and the fruits um, that our environment provides to us. And it's a oh, really beautiful great. holiday. Yeah, um, that's super neat. fun, super yeah. special. Um, one of the really nice traditions is to plant parsley seeds because if we plant them now, they will have grown and they'll be ready for us to use for our Passover Seder, which we'll right. get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's what my children did this past weekend. Um, and then we have the holiday of Purim, which is a great time. It's like a masquerade. It's celebrating the book of Esther. Um, and I, and again, overlapping um, with Christianity, the book of Esther, right? Um, and what I really love about Purim is that we get to celebrate a heroine, um, you know, a woman who saves the Jewish people from annihilation. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a really um, fun um, and then celebratory holiday. Um, and then we have Passover and um, Passover is um, since moving to York, Passover is really the one that I get the most questions around that I think um, a lot of Christians um, in general um, 
you know, have interest in um, leading up to um, Jesus's crucifixion. It's Mm -hmm. all in that same time period um, and um, timeline. Um, And so we have a Passover Seder, which um, commemorates um, the Exodus. Um, And it's a wonderful meal that we have with family uh, this year on Zoom, like everything else. (laughs) But um, nevertheless, um, we have a lot of symbolisms on our plate. And it's just really um, filled with imagery of the past and then looking towards the present and the Mm -hmm. future. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like a lot of the holidays mark important points of your history as well as some others mark um, important aspects of today's life, like the the growing of the trees and and that sort of thing. But um, I I was, I'm really taken by the fact that so many of them mark your history as a people, because I'm one of those that feels if we lose our history, you know, we have no idea where we are or where we're headed, you know, and that that's a beautiful thing. That, that those holidays are there to remind people. So know? a lot of times, um, like if you are looking at um, the Torah, right? Like not the Torah scroll, which is kept inside of the synagogue, right. inside of an arch. But if you're looking at the Bible, right? And you have it in your hands. Um, some of our um, Bibles are called the living Bible. Um, I know that that kind of translates, there's some churches here, the living word and the different things. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, so what does that actually mean? It means that these stories, right? These, um, these biblical stories, they all, um, regardless if do you think they are fact and that's okay and that's great? Or if you, you think that they're lessons to be learned, they all have value that translates across time um, right. and the span of, um, of peoplehood, really. So our holidays really talk about the history, the peoplehood, um, as well as they are seasonal holidays that celebrate um, nature and its season. And life now, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think you you just answered one of the other questions I had, but but just to make sure that that I've got this right. Now you describe the Torah as being on the scrolls, and I've seen numerous pictures of that. And of course, it's written in he- Hebrew, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there? It sounds like there is a companion piece in English for the average. Jewish person to sit down and read. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, so essentially, um, if you're looking at the, at the, at the Bible, you will have the Hebrew and Hebrew is read right to left versus English right. that's read left to right. So our books all open the opposite direction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm using my hands a lot, that's kind yeah. of where I was going. But um, but yes, it has the Hebrew. It has a lot of times what we call the transliteration. So if you are not fluent in Hebrew, you can, it's um, written out phonetically in English, the Hebrew sounds, the Hebrew prayers, and then it's also written out in English for you to read or or recite. Um, But you bring up a very good point because, you know, um, I've had the, I've had the wonderful opportunity of traveling a little bit um, to some other countries while in undergrad and grad school. And, um, you know, we think about it, this is very an American term, but if you go to, let's say the Ukraine, um, it has the Hebrew, and then it has um, the Ukrainian language. Um, In Israel, it's only Hebrew because they speak Hebrew. So Jews around the world, um, it's really translated to whatever their, you know, national tongue is. Oh, that's great. That's great. And they are, and, and Jews are encouraged to read it on their own and make their own interpretations, understandings, that sort of thing. Is that correct? 
Yes, um, okay. but I will say that it's better in pairs. Um, so in Judaism, there is, um, it's very special when people come to learn together. Right. Um, and so when you study, you typically study Torah um, or the Midrash or um, the Gomorrah, you study it in pairs so that you can bounce ideas off. You're supposed to be engaged in a conversation and ah, even okay. a little arguing amongst the scholars or amongst everyday people, right, is healthy. You're supposed post a question you're maybe not supposed to is the wrong word but you're encouraged to question it because when, the more you question and the more you engaged in study the more connected you essentially you are. become to the text right okay that's great that's good to know the reason i ask is because i know that most christian faiths um you know encourage the reading and the study of the bible but there are some who who actually discourage it um and with the un understanding that only those who or who are ordained can read that and tell you what it says so that the individual um is is not encouraged to to investigate on their own i'm glad to hear this is slightly different and yeah. Lou's popped up again, so i believe he has some questions for us i, I do have one question and, and i'll just make a quick a comment that growing up as a Jew, I always felt that my rabbi and my, our religious leaders encouraged us not only to read it, but to understand it and, and to be, be part of a, the religion rather than be dictated to. And I'm, I'm not trying to comment on any other religion, yeah. uh, but this is the one difference I noticed growing up as a kid. Kids would go to church and sit and, and listen and we were encouraged to, you know, through religious schools to engage in those conversations. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's um, great. Quick question. Um, could you explain what Yiddish is and possibly maybe touch on the diaspora for um, people because I think they're connected? Um, sure. So, um, well, Yiddish right now mostly is um what we consider to be a dead language um however in i don't know how else to say it. i don't know if that's the correct terminology much like latin right yeah. um, it's not frequently used, used. by people yeah. um however um I would say that in recent times, it's kind of making a trendy comeback into pop culture, um, which is fascinating in and of itself. Um, <laughs> but um, Yiddish really started um, in Eastern Europe. It's, it's a dialect, um, a mixture of dialects that started in these little towns or shtetls, right? Um, that had pockets of Jewish individuals. And it's Yiddish is a combination of Hebrew or and German, or um, even there's like a Hebrew and French. It's just a variety of different languages kind of pushed together for whatever um, your little social bubble, your town, right? Your shuttle um, was speaking during the time. Sounds like Pennsylvania Dutch to a point. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> my colleague actually does a presentation on the similarities yeah. um, between between the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and I think um, Lou had another question about the diaspora, um, and and I think it um, that that's a term that I learned uh, uh, many years ago, and it really confused me at first, but. I think maybe you would do a much better job of explaining that. So I'll leave that up to you. I will certainly try. Um, so the diaspora is a term used to describe any Jewish person living outside of the land of Israel. That is mm -hmm. the term. That is the definition in its most simplistic form. Um, the diaspora has a long history, right? Um, because Israel wasn't all, 
ideologically, Israel was always a Jewish state, but politically and nationally, um, Israel has had a long history of, um, of not being a Jewish state, right? Um, and so myself, I am considered to be um, a Jew living in the diaspora, living in the United States. Um, and some people think that it is really our Jewish obligation to return to the homeland at some point in time. For permanent residents or um, to touch base? <laughs> so you know, I, I'm thinking of of other religions that that travel to Mecca at least one point time in their life. What um, is it for that purpose? The the religious ideal, um, and we I know this was, excuse me, I know this was one of the topics that you had kind of sent me in advance, talking about the different branches of Judaism, but mm -hmm. the um, but the religious, the traditional view, um, is that the Messiah will only come when the Jews in the diaspora return. Oh, okay. So it is in that hope, it is in that goal, it is with that deep-rooted religious sentiment that it's described. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Now you just touched on, <laughs> on the, um, different groups or sex or flavors, however you want to describe all it. All of the above. <laughs> yeah, all of the above. Um, and, and I know that that um, there are some that are, are not very well known around here. Um, I'm thinking of the Hasidic Jews. Um, you rarely see someone in that, um, in that grouping in our area. Um, but they it could be people in all of the other groupings because they're not they don't dress in a particular way to distinguish themselves so could you give us a little bit of an explanation of of some of the groups and Absolutely. what is the biggest group in our part of the country sure um <clears throat> so there are I would say there's three main groups. There's the um, Orthodox, Conservative, and what we call Reform. Um, okay. Orthodox, um, they also have kind of a spectrum. Um, what you were referring to as the Hasidic, right? Um, those would be the individuals who, if you saw them, right? Um, they would be wearing, the men would be wearing black hats or they would be wearing kippahs or yarmulkes on their head. They would be wearing the traditional garb, black coat, black slacks. The women dressed very modest. They all wear um, dresses um, all the time. Um, it comes down past their knee, um, their shoulders, are always covered usually in three quarter length sleeves, if not full length sleeves. And their head is covered um, by typically wearing a wig. Um, so their hair, um, and you can see from the way that I'm dressed that I'm not Orthodox. Um, <laughs> and, um, and their hair is reserved for their spouse. Um, okay. And it is a form of modesty. Um, if you were to meet or greet an Orthodox individual and you were of the opposite sex of them, you would not go to shake their hands. Um, touching is reserved for the spouse. It's called Shomer Nagila. Um, and they don't greet in that fashion. Um, a man can shake another man's hand. A woman can shake another woman's hand. But you, you just greet um, from afar. Mm -hmm. and it's perfectly acceptable to do so. Um, those individuals, um, the Orthodox community, they adhere um, to Jewish law. Um, they observe the Sabbath, which is another holiday that I didn't touch on um, when I was going over the holidays chronologically. Um, the Jewish Sabbath or Shabbat, um, that is a weekly occurrence. It happens at Friday every week at sundown and lasts until Saturday at sundown. 
during that time, um, Orthodox Jews, they abstain from doing any work. Um, so what does work mean? This is where some of that interpretation comes in from, right? Um, so an Orthodox family would not drive their car. They would not turn on a light switch. Anything in their home, if they wanted a light on, it would have to remain on that entire time period. They would have all of their meals pre-cooked because they wouldn't be creating, right? Um, they would wow. be, um, so they would not cook. Um, they could read, they could go to a park, they could go for a walk, and of course go to synagogue um, or shul. Um, but everything else they would abstain from every Friday from sundown to Saturday at sundown. Mm -hmm. um, the conservative community um, and those individuals, sorry, they would also keep strict kosher, um, which is the dietary laws and practices. Um, and those laws are very strict for them, um, which means that they abstain from eating pork or shellfish and mixing meat and milk, um, even to the point where most of those households have two sets of dishes to be right. used. Mm -hmm. um, and then the conservative community, um, a large part looks and dresses like me, but they probably would keep kosher or maybe adhere to some more of the variety of rituals. Um, the reform community, um, it's not reformed or reforming. It's just a more modern interpretation of the laws um, where there isn't such an emphasis on um, keeping kosher as as a way to connect with God, um, being in um, synagogue, doing activities, um, you know, those are really the ways that the reform community can connect. And all of the above, um, you know, read from the Torah and, um, and celebrates the holidays. There's really no tremendous differences, um, but there's slight variations. Um, right. I okay. can go on. Here in right. York, um, we have a reform um, congregation, um, and we also have a conservative congregation. You're absolutely right. Um, the Orthodox families, they, they, even if they wanted to come here, they couldn't come here. Um, the two main reasons why that is at this point in time, there is no kosher food here for them, right? So that's a big okay. deterrent. Um, and there's no Orthodox synagogue, okay? The closest Orthodox synagogue um, that I know of, um, and I don't think that there is one in Hanover, there is some in Harrisburg, there's some in Lancaster, okay? okay. Um, and I'm not from here, so excuse my pronunciation of yeah. all of the things, okay? <laughs> quite all right. Yeah. Um, so, um, and, um, and, with those being so far, like I said, they walk to shul and they would not be able to walk from here. Right. So those I are the main there. reasons why you couldn't um, see ortho an Orthodox community here. It's mm -hmm. not to say that one could not be built, but that's why you don't have one. Right, yeah, okay. Um, you sort Ooh, of touched question? on, the, yeah, you sort of touched on the question of what is kosher? Uh-huh. And um, I, I might ask to help further understanding of kosher is, is where does the idea of being kosher come from, which I know you can speak to much better than I can. Um, and then the other part of this question is how can one tell that packaged food is kosher? Man, I wish I had pictures to show y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so much easier than like describing itty bitty symbols. Okay, um, we'll start with a little bit of the background. Um, keeping kosher comes from the Torah. Um, you are not supposed to um, eat bottom feeders of the ocean um, or any animals with split hooves that chew their own cud. Okay, that's kind of the terminology that is mm -hmm. used. Um, so that's why um, we abstain from eating pork um, as 
one of the main non-kosher items, okay? There's other animals that we don't eat that have split hooves, right? Um, and bottom feeders. So what is bottom feeders? It's crab, it's shellfish, it's, you know, um, all the all the Maryland stuff, right, yes. of our neighbors <laughs> that um, I'm sure are loved, right? Um, you know, many, um, many Jews um, steer, steer clear of. We also don't, um, we don't mix meat and milk because it says that you don't want to um, cook the baby and the mother's milk. Um, so that's primarily talking about cows and that again, that interpretation has come, um, has come into play where instead of trying to nitpick, let's just make a rule that's all encompassing. So we wouldn't eat chicken with cheesecake or chicken Parmesan, that's a better example. Um, okay. We wouldn't have pepperoni pizza. Um, as we're looking at more modern terminology or a bacon cheeseburger. <laughs> um, right. so, um, so you wouldn't mix meat and milk and, um, and you wouldn't eat pork or shellfish. Um, so I like to try to describe it, um, keeping kosher in a very simplistic term. If you're familiar with like a Venn diagram where the center mm -hmm. is the similarities, right? Um, what is interesting is that eggs um, and fish um, are not considered to be meat. So you can eat eggs and fish with either dairy or with meat. So you could have, you know, this, the stereotypical cream cheese, bagel, lox, mm -hmm. or you can have your chicken salad with your tuna salad and it doesn't make a bit of difference. Or a cheese omelet. Correct. That would, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Without the bacon. Just without the bacon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of us are skipping bacon these days just because of the fat. So you're a step yeah. ahead of us, you know, you're a step ahead of us. So, so. one thing that, um, <clears throat> sorry, one thing that has come up, I know amongst my circle of, of um, friends and, and folks that I converse with regularly, um, actually due to COVID, um, is, is what is the Jewish view of death and the afterlife. Um, there have been so many people we've lost in the last year. And um, every night we hear on the news of somebody, someone else famous who may or may, who may have been Jewish. Um, so, uh, of course, you know, there's some who it wasn't COVID, you know, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and you know, folks like her. And, and you start to talk about different practices surrounding death um, and, and, and mourning and um, the whole funeral practices. How, first of all, do Jews believe in an afterlife? And secondly, can you tell me a little bit about the practices surrounding the end of life and the mourning uh, period afterwards? Yeah. Um... So the short answer is yes, absolutely. Jews believe in an afterlife. Okay. Um, there isn't a lot of discussion surrounding that okay. um, in our culture and in our community. And I think one of the main reasons is I'm gonna go back to, to Kuno Lum and repairing the world. Um, component and aspect for a moment, because I think the main reason why we don't speak of it so much is because we're really focused on here and now and living the best life that we can wow. and the most responsible life that we can. And the life that is of, you know, servitude and grace and so on. Um, and that's very important um, to Kun Olam and carrying through the mitzvot, which we didn't really touch upon, um, as well as um, 
as well as um, Sadaka and volunteerism. Um, so that's why I think we don't touch upon what really transpires, or maybe it's because we just don't know, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and so, um, but our morning ritual, um, our morning rituals are really quite beautiful. Um, and forgive me, I'm, um, I'm getting a little choked up, so I apologize. No fault That's of your it. own. <laughs> um, right. But um, when we, um, as an individual is passing, they, um, if they wish, they can meet with a rabbi to discuss um, their life. The you know, bring some calm, bring some peace, right, um, to the families. Um, when a person passes, we have a beautiful ritual um, called sitting Shiva. Not sure if any of you have ever heard of it yes. um, yeah. or participated in it or attended a service. Um, but for approximately anywhere from three to seven days, right, depending on how religious you are, um, if you have a close family member who passes, then you would sit Shiva. And the tradition around that is um, you really just try to immerse yourself in your grief um, with your family, with your friends, with your community. So you pretty much have an open house. Um, some traditions say that you sit on um, boxes, you take away the comfort of things, um, and we cover all of our mirrors in our home because we don't want to see our, we don't, there's two reasons for that. One reason um, is that we don't want to appear vain during this time. Another mm -hmm. reason is we don't want to look ourselves in the mirror and see the similarities of the mother or father of ours that just passed. Right. Um, okay. And another tradition is, is at the burial site, um, Jews are usually, um, it's tradition um, to um, be buried um, and not cremated, although that's not, um, it's not a rule, um, a hard and fast rule, it's just typically the case. And that's really to honor those who perished in the Holocaust, um, who died in the crematories. Um, and so that's, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, so we, um, typically are, are buried. It's, um, it's not totally out of the realm of possibilities for a Jewish person to be cremated, but it's, it's not the norm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, so you are buried a year later on the anniversary of the, your loved one's passing. That's when you put the headstone on um, and a tradition for us is not to leave um, flowers at a grave site because flowers die. Um, so we bring rocks because mm -hmm. rocks will last forever, forever, little pebbles. So, um, so if you um, are typically, if you are traveling abroad to Israel or anywhere, right? Um, sometimes you'll see Jews who will bring home rocks um, from different places that they visited for that purpose. This. Um, mm -hmm. So every time I go to Israel, I bring home rocks um, for for that type of for, purpose. For that purpose, yeah. yeah, yeah. I had read that that about the the rocks that that was the reason, and I thought that was so beautiful because there's nothing worse than than um, seeing those flowers that were so beautiful one day and now they're withered and gone, and it just brings more sadness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I know that, that was a difficult topic, but I appreciate you touching on it. So, no, it, it, it hits close to home for a lot of people. And, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that we are all going to slowly but surely pull out of this pandemic and, you know, and that um, we'll, we'll make it our way through it like we've done with so many other things. So many other things, yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. So, Lou, you have questions for us, I believe. Um, well, I do have at least uh, a question or two. Um, 
answered one about the rocks, which is awesome. Um, I've, I've also been experienced losses in, in my family and, and some of the, the beautiful things about it, about a loss is that, um, especially with my mom, because we were older, uh, we were encouraged as a tradition to throw dirt on the coffin. The actual goal there is to have family finish burying um, the coffin as a way, to, and you can correct me, I interpret it as finishing the journey yeah of your loved ones no i you, think that that's a beautiful description of that absolutely and the the other thing that you know and, and i don't think it's too different in 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 other religions in other circles um but um, my experience is that our religious leaders and our rabbis have always um, impressed on us the importance of telling stories and remembering your loved one in a happy way. Um, mm -hmm. If you've ever heard uh, Wolf Blitzer talk about people that have passed from COVID at the end, he says, yes. may their memories be a blessing. Thing. Yes. And, and, and that's, that's that origin of, of that. Mm -hmm. I think you touched on some really nice points. Um, may your memory be a blessing that it is the legacy of a person's life that they are living or that they are leaving behind. Um, and so what is the legacy that you want to create that will remain here to, um, you know, long after you're gone. Um, and I think that that's just another way that Judaism places so much emphasis on the here and now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, another way that um, that, that is symbolized um, during funeral services and sitting Shiva um, is that again, very similar to why the rocks are placed on the gravestone, um, why you don't typically send flowers to a person's home, you always send food because you yes. want to make sure <laughs> that mm -hmm. that individual is eating and thriving and, you know, being able to deal with all of those emotions involved, but that they are still functioning and they are still um, surviving through it. Um, and then another way is that um, in in their in the passing of a loved one's memory, it is very customary to um, to give a donation in their honor. Right. Um, and that's um, very important to the Jewish community as well, to whatever mm -hmm. organization the family deems appropriate. Mm -hmm. To go, to go just a little bit lighter, I do have a, a question. Um, how would you answer someone who asks, what is the difference between Christianity and Judaism? Sort of in, in a Cliff Notes simple um, manner. And I think, um, and before we go on, it is eight o'clock. We usually only go an hour, but we did start a little late. So anybody that's listening, I think we're going to go another five to 10 minutes if our host and guest are okay with that. Sure. My kids aren't screaming yet. So bonus. <laughs> <laughs> or, or your husband's in trouble. Or yeah. he's asleep. I don't know which. <laughs> Maybe they're all asleep. <laughs> yeah. um, so I would say, I would say that um, I, it's, you know, I think that, again, I think that there's a lot of similarities um, and there's a handful of differences between Judaism and Christianity. Um, I would say that um, if I was speaking, the main difference would be in Christianity, the Messiah has come and in Judaism, the Messiah is yet to come. Yeah. And that is the, that it really is the, um, the biggest, um, the biggest difference, but I mean, mm -hmm. culturally and morally, you know, um, I feel very deeply that we all want, you know, very similar things. Right. Very similar. Absolutely. From a humanitarian and, you know, um, perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, 
I wanted to mention, um, Rachel, before we get to the end, that tomorrow, of course, is Holocaust Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, that's going to be something pretty large on your calendar and the calendar of the JCC as well. Um, I did pull up some information from the um, US Holocaust um, Museum in DC that they've got a variety of events going on tomorrow online, of course. So I would encourage any of our listeners who would be interested to please make sure that they check um, that website for the United States Holocaust um, Museum for Remembrance Day tomorrow. And I also think that YouTube has a number of things planned as well. Um, is there anything in particular at the JCC that you know that is um, open to the public or available for folks? Yeah, I'm really glad that you asked. Um, we actually, um, um, Deb Smith, who maybe some of you um, know, she's very active in the Hanover community as she is, I feel, everywhere. Yes. Um, <laughs> she, she, um, she is helping to spearhead a Holocaust education book club um, at the JCC. It starts, um, it starts on Zoom Thursday. The first book we will be reading is Train by Danny M. Cohen. Uh -huh. um, and it will be a three-week session and it's free and open to the public to dive into that book. Um, and during the last session in February, um, the author Danny will be joining us Mm -hmm. um, and you can sign up for all three weeks or you can sign up just to hear from the author. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something very special that we will be um, doing. Um, as you mentioned, the National um, Holocaust Museum in DC, um, they have been doing really amazing um, Facebook live programs. So if you're interested in the subject, Matter, follow them on Facebook. Um, they um, do education live events um, pretty frequently. Um, and then during Yom HaShoah, um, which is um, Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, it is um, in uh, late, um, wait a second, late April this year. Mm -hmm. um, so some thing we didn't bring up is that our holidays fluctuate a little bit right. yeah. um, so that's why I have to kind of think about it they're not um, at the same day in um, every single year and we can talk about why that is another time but um, but it will be in May and we definitely do a Yom HaShoah a large program honoring those who perished and we partner with other organizations oh, to do that's that that's great as well. that's great yeah. Yeah, I can definitely recommend that book, The Train. Yeah. Um, yeah, Deb took um, a group of us from the YW uh, here in Hanover through that book a couple of, of uh, I guess it was a couple of months ago at this point. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a journey in itself. Well, um, if you missed it then and you're watching, you should hop on ours. Yeah. Otherwise, Deb will just have to recycle it all over again. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Any final questions, Lou, before we close up? I think that is it. Someone mentioned about, uh, just wanted to mention also as far as part of a ritual of when people pass, there's a, a tradition of having a tree planted in their honor. Mm -hmm. in, in Israel, sort of maybe, uh, I'm not sure if, where that started, but possibly you can tell us, Rachel. Um, yeah, so that's a beautiful tradition. Um, there's a nonprofit agency called the Jewish National Fund. Um, they have been around for um, decades. Um, and um, most of those trees are planted um, through that organization. Um, and it, it again, um, planting a tree in honor of someone symbolizes life. It symbolizes rebirth. Right. It symbolizes something that is going to really um, 
stand tall and leave a mark, right? Um, and um, is a beautiful concept. Um, a fun fact is that um, Israel is the only country to end, well, I guess it's been a while now since I've said this quote out loud, but to end the millennial with more trees <laughs> than they started with. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, you know, um, Israel being the debt, you know, and Israel is not something that we touched upon. So I'll just give this little tidbit. If you've never been to Israel, go. Um, it's absolutely amazing. I've been three times, I can't can't wait to offer another trip through the JCC. Hopefully, um, all things considered in 2022, we'll be going. Um, but um, it's an amazing place. But, um, un, you know, we started, you started the conversation by talking about, um, you know, um, different ideas that mm -hmm. might not be the, the truth or the whole truth, right? Um, and Israel just, I feel like embodies that. Um, right. So the one thing, <laughs> the one thing is um, Israel is, um, has conflict, but is not always at war. Um, Israel is a desert but has tremendous forests <laughs> um, and they are doing amazing technological and environmental studies in the desert. Um, for example, last time I was there, I saw them cultivating algae as a food resource um, for impoverished countries in Africa. Um, oh, and wow. so um, their innovation is amazing and they are, um, and in Israel, um, they are one of the largest tech startup groups um, mm -hmm. outside of the Bay Valley um, and one of the largest um, employers of women and advocating for women's rights and the LGBTQ community. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's so, way... Israel is way more than what the news um, portrays. You. It as. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a ma it's a magical mm -hmm. land. I lived there for three years. Um, ah, really? That's just fantastic. a magical place in a, yeah. in a lot of ways, and everywhere you look, there's antiquity. Um, so, um, and and yet the future is happening in amongst all of the antiquity. You yes, know? they're yes. they're very forward thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for yeah. for a country that's the size of New Jersey, um, and very little uh, resources, they're very resourceful in mm -hmm. making sure that they survive and and prosper and um, forward the sciences. Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think well, Rich, Joel, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And so I'm sorry we had those little glitches in the beginning, but that's the nature of tech. It happens. It is so. the nature of the beast. I get it. Yes, and, uh, <laughs> but we survived, and I think we we all learned quite a bit. And uh, from both you and Lou, I appreciate both of you. Um, helping us to understand a bit more about Judaism, um, what it is, what it isn't, and just to, to just get a better understanding. So um, I invite all of you, if you continue to have questions, please write in. We can forward them to Rachel um, or find other resources for you. Um, next month in February, which is not that far away, we will be hosting two York County um, residents. I'm not gonna say natives because I'm not sure where they're, if they were originally from York County or not, but we're gonna be talking about the history of uh, black folks in York County since um, February is Black History Month. We're gonna talk about the history of black people in York County. One of the individuals joining us is a uh, master craftsman at the history of York County. So I think we will all learn quite a bit. So, and Lou will post those, that date um, as we get a little bit closer to it toward the end of February. But um, thank you very much. And thank you all for listening. And uh, please come back again. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Good night. Thank you very much. Hey.
go up there and follow us if you're not already following us on Facebook yeah. <laughs> and uh, watch our website and uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Thank he you, does everybody. them all. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you all. Bye-bye.